Now we're going to read from this book. It's called Unearthed in Ancient America, The Lost Sagas of Conquerors, Castaways, and Scoundrels. Again, from Frank Joseph, same author. I'm in chapter one, it says here, Anomalous Artifacts. Mainstream scholars scoff at the very notion of ancient Egyptians sailing to our shores. All right. So I just want to, again, remind you that, you know, this author goes with you know, the whole, that the old world's on the other side, Mesopotamia, Egypt, you know, the fake, fake places. So he's finding Egyptian stuff here, right? He knows for sure it's Egyptian, but of course he's going to add the out of Africa theories. So mainstream scholars will laugh if you say, well, the ancient Egyptians were here. Yet a ritual grave object could be physical proof of visitors to the American Midwest from the Nile Valley. Nile is right great river in Greek. The Mississippi in the Ojibwe, Algonquin word, right, is also means great river. So what are you talking about? Because the Mississippi, you got mounds all over it. Remember Mound City, Cahokia, and all this other stuff, all these mounds that got destroyed, all the stuff they're finding in these places. We've already gone over some. All right. So just again, try to stay in the right perspective when we're reading this stuff. This potentially revealing find is described by Wayne May, the founder and publisher of Ancient American Magazine. I actually called him up. He's a great guy. He sold me some magazines. Going to buy some more. He is also the author of This Land, his series of books describing a period in North American prehistory known as Hopewell, from 200 BC to 400 AD. Now it says here, an ancient Egyptian statue found in Illinois by Wayne May. News occasionally surfaces of persons claiming to have uncovered a dynastic Egyptian presence in prehistoric America. Unfortunately, their proofs for pharaonic visitors here are at best theoretically possible or at worst patently erroneous. Far less often a piece of exceptionally persuasive evidence emerges. Such was a statute featured on the front cover of Ancient American's 64th issue in 2006. And this is the uh, image right here. All right. You guys can take a look at it. See that? They found that here. They found that here in the real ancient Egypt. They found that here. The Egyptian statuette allegedly removed from an ancient burial mound in Libertyville, Illinois. Little is known of the object's modern origins. Save that it was found in Libertyville, Illinois, some 20 miles north of Chicago. During the time of its discovery, in the early part of the 20th century, Libertyville was a sparsely populated agricultural community with only a few dirt roads, in sharp contrast to the sprawl of upper-class suburbia that mostly blankets the area today, just off of I-94 tollway. But before World War II, only several dozen families, mostly farmers, were spread over some 12,000 acres of largely pristine prairie. As a young man, the discoverer, whose widow has requested anonymity for her late husband, developed an abiding interest in collecting Indian artifacts, mostly arrowheads, he found in the vicinity of his home. But the richest sources for prehistoric materials were along the banks of the Des Plaines River and nearby Diamond Lake. 
otherwise seldom visited, its five-mile shoreline featured a number of Indian burial mounds. He riffled for whatever grave goods might be dug out. These were usually limited to small pipes, spools, bones, flints, and other typical items. From one earthwork, however, he allegedly extracted a most atypical statuette. He never attempted to have his discovery professionally evaluated and showed it to only a few fellow collectors, perhaps for fear of criticism, either for having removed the object without informing the archaeological authorities in Chicago, or because such finds were automatically condemned as the forgeries of conmen trying to defraud money from collectors. Time passed. By the turn of the 21st century, his assemblage of more conventional Native American artifacts reached prodigious proportions. Only then did word of the strange statue reach me, and I, thanks to the generosity of a loyal subscriber, was able to purchase it. The well-crafted object stands nine inches high, weighs approximately half a pound, and appears to have been sculpted from a single piece of off-white soapstone. It portrays a man wrapped in a kind of body stocking, from which his emergent hands holds a shepherd crook in the left and a flail in the right. The flail was an agricultural tool used in dynastic times by Nile Valley farmers to separate wheat from chaff by beating stacks of grain on a stone floor for threshing. Pharaohs were commonly depicted in sacred art holding such a device as the emblem of judgment, separating the good from the bad subjects. The shepherd's crook stood for political guidance over his flock, people. The Libertyville figure wears a stylized wig behind the ears, together with a long beard, beginning at the waist and descending to an area corresponding to the ankles are eight lines of hieroglyphic text, with a single additional line composed of four glyphs running top to bottom from the ankles to the unexposed toes. Dr. Thompson's observations demonstrate the possibility, at least of Egyptian voyagers to North American dynastic times. He was supported by Dr. Barry Fell, another unconventional scholar who uncovered evidence for an ancient Egyptian written language among Native Americans. At Harvard's Widener Library, he, with the help of fellow researcher, located copies of a 300-year-old paper composed by a Jesuit missionary in Canada's eastern provinces. The priest had apparently put together a teaching aid for his Mi'kmaq Indian students who copied out the Lord's Prayer in hieroglyphics. On closer examination, about half were recognizable hieratic and simplified form of Egyptian hieroglyphics. More surprisingly, the Mi'kmaq characters corresponded to the meaning of the Egyptian glyphs. Dr. Fell concluded that someone familiar with Egyptian hieroglyphic writing very long ago had contrived the Mi'kmaq writing system of hieratic symbols. All right, do you guys hear that? That's exactly what they found, um, you know, the Mormons, right? That's what Joseph Smith found, these tablets in New York in a cave, and they were of Mi'kmaq, and they had this old Egyptian-type script that they're calling it here. This is what they're talking about. And this was studied by Harvard. This is stuff they never told you. More evidence for Egyptian influence in pre-Columbian America surfaced in the Michigan tablets during the 1840s. Most of these inscribed artifacts display an unfamiliar written script that nonetheless includes several Egyptian hieroglyphs. Again, so-called Egyptian hieroglyphs, right? America's true old world. What's it really called? Tamarian? <laughs> Tamari? Additional examples of Nile Valley effect on prehistoric America came from Burroughs Cave. All right, we're going to get into Burroughs Cave. Don't worry, guys. I know there's major things coming out of there in southern Illinois. I've been following that for years. All right, Burroughs Cave. Of the 7,000 inscribed stones removed from it since 1982, all right, that's the year I was born, few bear traces of Egyptian hieroglyphics, although many do depict persons dressed in Nile Valley garb. Joshua Priest in his book, American Antiquities, Discoveries in the West, all right, we've read his book, was one of the two mid-19th century explorers who documented the rock art illustrations of similarly custom men and women adorning the walls and ceilings of a site known as Cave in Rock State Park, again in southern Illinois. These varied collections of evidence support archaeological probabilities for the Liberty Bill Ushapti. Similar examples have been found elsewhere in the Americas, according to Mariano Cuevas, 
in his 1922 Historia de la Nación Mexicana, an incident along the line of our inquiry into contact between Mexico and Egypt, which no Americanist can ignore, has been the fortuitous discovery of two statuettes. Their discovery was made a few years ago in August 1914 in a rural parish of His Excellency the Archbishop of San Salvador, the Reverend Father Belloso. All right, again, and this is again another book, another source telling us of the uh, statues they found of Osiris and Isis in El Salvador. We've already done a video about this. Make sure you check it out if you haven't. We talked about it a little bit in a, one of the recent videos again. And it's going to tell us a here firsthand account of the reverend who actually found it or had it in his possession in, the in 1914. It says, Professor Miguel Angel Gonzalez was conducting precise excavations in the city of Acajutla in the Maya area near the farthest limit of the railroad line. All right, this is in El Salvador, Central America. These excavations, which were undertaken at the request of the aforementioned archbishop, resulted in the uncovering of two precious artifacts. One has to keep in mind that many similar objects have been encountered by ignorant natives and subsequently ruined. At this same site, according to the Central American historian Garcia Palaez, who was later Archbishop of Guatemala, there existed an antiquity a city that was very grand and important. The most important fact of the statuette is that it represents a sarcophagus or mummy of a male. It gives all the appearances of resembling an Egyptian statuette. If we make closer inspection and focus our attention on the headdress, we notice a typically Egyptian beard beneath the point of the chin. More than anything else, the inscriptions on both statuettes have Egyptian features, such as the classical ellipse or cartouche on the male statuette. We are led to conclude without the slightest doubt that these are Egyptian. They are similar to statues in pictures by Champollion, mark for mark. They have demonic characteristics and hieroglyphics identical to those found on classical Egyptian monuments. All right, so even the hieroglyphics on it is exactly the same. Remember, they found this in El Salvador, which also have analogous ellipses. Because all these characteristics, which are comparable to features of artifacts in the Cairo Museum. Now pay attention, that's what I was saying earlier. How do we know a lot of those so-called artifacts in the Cairo Museum didn't come from ancient America when they were coming here with their manifest destiny, destroying everything and rewriting history? We are able to confirm assertions that we have established a certain Egyptian heritage of these statuettes. These Mexican counterparts of the Illinois statue not only tend to support its identification as an ancient Egyptian Ushapti, but also suggests that our continent was indeed visited by travelers from the Nile Valley around 600 BC. All right, so dodge the hijack. This is the Mississippi is the Nile, meaning Great River. That is the Great River. That's a Greek word. Now this is a Greek word, guys. Egypt also is a Greek word. The Temple of Pita. I'm gonna read from uh, this book real quick. It's called The Lost History of Ancient America. How our continent was shaped by conquerors influencers and other visitors from across the ocean this is by frank joseph a very famous author and when the, these kind of uh, things um i do want to say though you know he's still coming within you know mesopotamia out of africa kind of mind frame you know when he wrote his books america's a true old world why you think they're finding all these things here all these so-called influences this is the old world I'm gonna read this real quick very interesting you guys don't know about it this is chapter three it says here egyptian style cat burial in illinois by professor julia patterson more than 30 years ago before highway construction engineers could obliterate a prehistoric burial ground archaeologists excavated its 14 earthworks of various sizes the structures were perched atop a bluff overlooking the illinois rivers in the western part of the prairie state less than 50 miles north of St. Louis, Missouri. The largest dome of configured soil measured 92 feet across and stood eight feet high as part of the Hopewell Culture Complex some 2,000 years ago. All right, so before this was destroyed, we already know they destroyed many mounds, a lot of the architecture, a lot of the uh, prehistoric buildings, mounds, cities. This was a common thing. 
The Hopewell were a mound builder people of far-flung traders and skilled artisans who flourished from circa 600 BC to their extermination of the hands of so-called Native American tribes by 400 AD. All right, so that's kind of big. They're saying Native American tribes came and destroyed the Hopewell culture, the mound builders. Hmm. Now we got to dodge the hijack with their carbon dating and dates. The Illinois site's foremost tomb was found to contain the bones of 22 human adults evenly laid out in a ring formation around the central sepulture of a male infant skeleton. All right, you guys hear that and picture that? Nearby, the child carefully interred in its own grave, paws respectfully placed together, were the remains of a bobcat wearing a necklace of drilled, carved bear teeth in the shells of marine animals. All right, look at that, a bobcat. Isn't that the logo of the Shatan clans of the Highland Scottish people? Shatan. They have a bobcat, and they were seafarers. So it's funny that you find this here with shells of marine animals. No other wildcat has been buried by humans in the entire archaeological record. Researchers claim in a study published recently by the Mid-Continental Journal of Archaeology, but this supposedly unique discovery went unrecognized until 2011 when Angela Perry, then a PhD student at Britain's University of Durham, re-examined the bobcat's bones, originally misidentified as those of a puppy. All right, you hear that? So they were saying it was a dog, but this was a cat. They were doing it. Were they doing it deliberately? Most likely. She and her colleagues surmised that the Hopewell had tamed the creature, and its revelation is therefore insightful into the human domestication of animals. Perhaps, but the Illinois find might be significant of something else. The interred bobcat was only between four and seven months old when it died of natural causes. There were no cut marks or signs of trauma, writes David Grimm, and science suggesting that the animal had not been sacrificed. The pomp and circumstance of the burial, she says, suggests this animal had a very special place in the life of these people. Though no other ceremonial interments of the kind have been found in pre-Columbian setting, many hundreds of thousands of ritualized feline graves are known in Egypt, where Bast, the famous cat goddess, was worshipped from at least the late first dynasty 2900 BC, probably during earlier pre-dynastic times. Now that's interesting, Bass, right? This was like a Black Panther female, <laughs> right, goddess? And we went over that. Now, if you haven't seen my original Black Panther video, Wakanda in America video, make sure to go check it out. We talk about Bass in that video and that literally you know, that's that's a black jaguar. That's that's what was here. One of the warrior Amazonian queens. Yeah, they dressed up as jaguars too. And, uh, you know, that whole thing comes from over here. Again, we just saw our video, right? Mammals, the oldest mammals they found was here. We know mammals originated. First ones that came out of the land was in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania period. We got the oldest water, oldest land, you know. So just put everything together. Again cats carnivores mammals came out of america these comparisons join a vast body of complementary evidence accumulated on behalf of pharaonic influences at work in pre-columbian america that's because ancient egypt was here the real now is the mississippi at very least they suggest that although the hopewell were not themselves transplanted egyptians they were nonetheless inheritors of a cultural legacies left behind by visitors from the Nile Valley to our continent during prehistory. All right. So that's all conjecture that part, because, again, he's coming with an out of Africa background. He wrote this book a while back. Hopefully by now he sees that America is a true world, just like Graham Hancock is realizing all this is going down right here. Remember who got corn? Corn is from here. Ancient Egyptians are growing corn. Corn is all over the Bible. Joseph. And him storing corn that was all right here, guys. Wow.